Dr. Uh, Henry Zerby. Um, Dr. Zerby's um, um, currently um, the Vice President of Protein Procurement and Innovation um, at Wendy's Quality Supply Chain Co-op, so um, part of the Wendy's family of businesses. And uh, he joined uh, uh, QSCC in 2016. Um, his team is responsible for the supply chain development um, and acquisition of all the animal protein products um, on the Wendy's menu. So that includes beef, chicken, uh, bacon, sausage, eggs, and cheese. Henry also provides uh, guidance uh, and thought leadership to the American Beef Initiative, so ABI, and serves as a member of Wendy's Animal Welfare Council. Uh, prior to joining QSCC, uh, Dr. Zerby served as chair of the Department of Animal Sciences at The Ohio State University. Um, the department was comprised of approximately 750 students, um, 60 staff, and 34 faculty members. Um, it utilized uh, um, multiple animal facilities uh, and species, so beef, dairy, equine, poultry, sheep, and swine, um, and a, a federally inspected processing facility um, to engage in a comprehensive teaching, research, and outreach program. Um, Dr. Zerby's research um, focused on uh, treatments and technologies to enhance the efficiency of food animal production while simultaneously improving the inherent qualities of the resulting meat products, so tenderness, water holding capacity, flavor, color, and wholesomeness. Um, uh, Henry previously served as a consultant to Wendy's Quality Assurance Team uh, from 2005 to 2016. Um, in that role, he provided technical expertise related to meat products, performed third-party animal welfare, product quality, and food safety audits um, in the harvest and further processing facilities for all animal protein products uh, in the Wendy's system. Um, so one of those, uh, you start as a consultant, you do a great job, get another uh, another opportunity. So uh, congratulations to, uh, to Dr. Zerby. Um, he obtained his uh, PhD and Master of Science um, uh, in Meat Science from Colorado State University. I think that's likely where he and I first met um, in his Bachelor of Science in Dairy and Animal Science with minors in Poultry Technology and Management uh, from Pennsylvania State University. So, um, Dr. Zerby, I see you're unmuted. Excellent. Um, you should have uh, remote control. And uh, we thank you for uh, joining us today and uh, look forward to, uh, to your comments. Well, thanks for the introduction and uh, just uh, for everybody uh, out there, just a couple things I want to say out of the gate. Uh, you know, I do work for a quality supply chain co-op, uh, I, I, you know, indirectly for Wendy's. But, uh, you know, the message that I have uh, for the folks out there today really isn't uh, I, I don't represent Wendy's. I'm not speaking on Wendy's behalf. Uh, and I really don't represent QSCC today. Uh, you know, really, the, I think the easiest way to think about it, I am a producer. I'm a beef producer. Uh, albeit probably not as large as some of those folks that are that are listening in uh, but you know and I come at uh, you know this subject maybe from a little bit different angle than a lot of other people uh, and you know I guess you know I have an appreciation for the multiple parts of the supply chain and part of my responsibilities are to be you know looking at and providing some direction uh, where we need to be 5, 10, 15 years down the road so that might help explain kind of you know the approach I take uh, to the topic here and and some of the slides that we'll talk about here a little bit later on. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, as we talk about, you know, what we need and, and what we want uh, in our part of the business, we're not that different than each of you in your part of the business. And it really comes down to the basic fundamentals that, uh, you know, what we're looking for is to have an advantageous value proposition uh, for those people that we're working with or that we're selling to. Uh, we all kind of want that in all aspects of our business uh, so that we can attract customers and keep customers coming back. And another part that's important to us is, you know, we look at ways for differentiation. Uh, you know, we want to figure out some things that are important to our customers that we can provide to them so that we can continue to be competitive out there in that marketplace. And, you know, it doesn't matter if we're selling hamburgers, if we're selling uh, chicken, or if we're selling genetics, uh, you know, like I try to do back here at home. Those are kind of some of the fundamentals that we follow. So, you know, I think uh, all of you have, have seen over time, and we talk about this quite a bit, you know, the increase in story proteins, and there's, you know, a lot of drivers out there. We'll continue to hear more about this, uh, you know, as things evolve. And, you know, there's locally produced, and we talk about freshness. We hear a lot more about carbon footprints and sustainable agriculture, those topics. 
Uh, we hear a lot about, you know, health and environment uh, production concerns, and we see, you know, a lot of things that uh, can be subcategories under each of those. And then, you know, I, you know, one of the things I always talk to our students about is, you know, not, let's not forget the the power in marketing and the power in money. And, you know, I always believed and still believe that, you know, we can make as much or more money selling food as entertainment as we can as nutrition. And so, you know, that's kind of the leverage we take on some of these uh, white tablecloth restaurants and we get into the backyard chefs and things like that. But a couple of things to keep in mind as, as we watch our society move and change over time is, you know, we know that uh, as people get older, uh, their sense of value changes and time and health become more important firm forms of currency. Uh, we also know that, you know, if we look at the baby boomer generation catching up to us now over the next few decades, you know, we're going to have a, a change in the overall demographic of our population and some of their needs and desires will change as well. And, you know, I happen to live in a house with uh, three teenage girls here. And I don't know, some of you may be in the same boat. And I can tell you that, you know, as I look at you know, the next 20 years and what senior living is going to look like. Uh, I haven't found the one of those yet that uh, really has uh, indicated that they're interested in taking care of me uh, in my older age. So I suspect we'll see a lot of opportunities for us to think about specializing some of the products that we produce uh, into some of these areas and capitalizing on some of those opportunities as, as we move forward. Uh, you know, a couple, couple of things just to lay out some of the background for you folks. You understand a little bit how I approach this, you know, uh, there's a few trends that I think, you know, we need to look at and we need to appreciate and understand because I think they'll continue to become more important over time. And, and one of those is just the general health of our society. Uh, and we talk about a lot about, you know, health conscious consumers. We talk a lot about the incidence of diabetes and obesity. And, and sometimes we get trapped in the argument of where they draw the line on, you know, body mass index and, you know, what, what defines somebody as obese or not. And, and you know, I'm not here to debate what that line is or where you draw the line. I'm here to look at the data and tell you that, you know, I think this thing is pretty real. Uh, so we moved from 1990 to 1998, and we look at the change in obesity presented by the Center of Disease Control over time. And then we jump another 10, 12 years, and we look at it again. Uh, you know, it, it's pretty uh, eye-opening, I think, uh, pretty revealing is, to what's going on in this country. Uh, and we're not alone. This is going on in most of the countries, developed countries around the world. Uh, and if we were to look at the 2015 or more recent data, we would see that, you know, 50% of the states are in the 30 plus category. We wouldn't have any states uh, left up there in yellow. So just to highlighting that I do believe that the health will be uh, one of the things that we need to continue to look at as we move along in, in our programs. Uh, you know, there was, when I was at the university, it was interesting, the, one of the books that they had the freshman class read one year was called Fast Food Nation. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with that book, but basically the premise was, you know, pointing fingers at the fast food restaurants or quick service industry is, is uh, you know, being part of the, the downfall leading to some of the obesity in our society. And I guess I take a little bit different look at it. Uh, and I, you know, as I talked to the students about that book, I said, ask them the question, you know, do you really believe that uh, that fast food changed society? Or do you believe that changes in society are what allowed, you know, fast food to, to be a successful business operation? And I, I, I share the story with you to let you to try and provide context that a lot of times I believe what changes our industry as we move along are more the extrinsic factors or things from outside our industry than those inside our industry. And so, for example, you know, if I look back in, you know, the mid 1950s, the late 1950s, when McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King and a lot of our quick service restaurants started to take hold, uh, it probably wasn't that they were changing society. It was changes in society that allowed that to happen. If you think back to who was president at the time, uh, Dwight Eisenhower's president, and one of the things that he did was develop the interstate highway system. So, you know, uh, those of you that remember the stories about Route 66, where people would take for vacation, and now all of a sudden we're going down interstate highways that crisscross the United States. And we needed places for people to stop to eat because we changed the way we were vacationing because the infrastructure in the country changed. The other big driver that allowed these, uh, you know, these types of food institutions to be successful is at the same time, 
that we saw a new beef processor on the market say they were going to do something different. And that was IBP when they came out with the box beef concept. And rather than selling whole carcasses or half carcasses, they decided, you know, we're going to allow uh, our customers to choose a box of ribeye rolls or a box of strip loins or, or whatnot. And that resulted in there being a lot of uh, trim or products that raw material that could go into ground patties. And so, you know, simultaneously, these things kind of matched up and, and started moving forward. So I do think that uh, sometimes we have to reflect back on some of the bigger picture and take a step back and look at some of this stuff. So, you know, some of the other things that I think about in my job as I'm thinking about, you know, where we need to be 10 uh, years down the road, you know, just uh, this map shows, you know, in, in 1950, we had about two and a half billion people on the on the planet. And if we jump forward in time, you know, we had about 18 megacities, and a megacity be defined as 10 million or more people out there. And you know what we're projecting in 2050, and where they're projecting uh, these people to be, I think tells us a little bit about what we can anticipate or what we can expect in terms of you know some of the market opportunities, but also some of the competition and and uh, pressures out there. It also speaks a lot to the caloric and specifically protein needs that, that we'll have in the future. And I think, you know, our industry has a big role in, in filling some of that uh, void or that need. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of demand out there. I kind of take a, you know, you might be able to tell now a big picture view at some of this stuff. I also think about, you know, from a ruminant animal uh, perspective, uh, a lot of our ruminant animals are, you know, going to use plant or you know feed-based resources coming out of plants and so when I look at where I think some of the competition is going to be and, and where some of the opportunities might be you know I look at okay where can we grow these plants and what's the photosynthesis rate uh, and so again I just kind of step back and take big picture views of some of this stuff before I hone down into some of the details. Certainly uh, there's a lot of debate in this area and a lot of you are very involved in these things but water quality and abundance will play a major role uh, you know, the reaction that we have sitting down here at the bottom of this slide, uh, water is the rate limiting step in there. And, uh, you know, we don't need to look too far back in history to be reminded uh, of when we have a lack of water in that particular reaction, the knock-on effects that it has on our industry. And so, you know, water quality, water availability are all things that we think about uh, in the back of our minds indirectly because we know they're going to impact our supply chain. So I think, you know, when I look at these kinds of things together, these maps uh, talk to me, they tell a story, uh, they change a little bit, you know, my thought processes, you know, I think through who, you know, who will our consumers be and, and why. Uh, I also think about, uh, you know, what will the balance be within, uh, you know, those markets and our domestic markets, international consumers and you know, there's a lot of talk about the haves and the have-nots, and I, rather than talk about them as have or have-nots, a lot of times I think about, you know, those that are desiring quality uh, because they can, and those that desire quantity uh, because they need it. And we can talk about that on an individual basis, or we can talk about that on population basis, uh, and there's mixes in there, but I do think these things uh, do shape some of the discussions that we have. So one of the things that I kind of wanted to focus a little bit more on as we move through that part was really to give you some background, uh, just to let you know a little bit the way I approach these subjects. But, you know, every day we drive up and down the road and there's this little message written on our car mirror. And it says objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. And I guess, you know, I want to remind you of that. And the thing is, I think, you know, we've had a tendency sometimes uh, to try to outrun some of these things. And, you know, some of these things are in our mirror. Uh, we're not going to be able to outrun. Uh, they are gaining ground on us, and we're going to have to figure out, you know, how we deal with them, how we manage them. And I think, you know, in the last few years, the industry has done a very good job starting to really have some robust conversations, and, and we've really seen some changes uh, around some of these topics and even some changes in the attitudes, uh, which I think is important as we move forward and as we, you know, try to understand our consumers uh, that much more. So biosecurity, you know, animal welfare, uh, Sean talked quite a bit about that one. Traceability, food security is one that I think through quite a bit. I'll talk a little bit to that one. Sustainability is, uh, and you know, and, and the last one on the list is uh, one that I think sometimes we don't spend enough time talking about. You know, when people talk to me about supply chain and uh, supply assurance, you know, succession planning really comes in to be 
a, a big part of that one. And, uh, you know, I commend those of you that have succession plans in place for, for your farms and ranches. And, you know, for those of you that don't, I encourage you to, to really uh, take a serious look at some of that and get ourselves set up. You know, how will we meet those protein needs of the future? We saw how, you know, tremendous the, the need's going to be out in front of there. And to me, you know, I'm a bit of a nerd. So, you know, I sometimes come back to the basic science and this stuff. And, you know, photosynthesis is uh, just an awesome, uh, awesome opportunity. And, and uh, it really what it does is it harnesses the energy from the sun, traps it in uh, bonds between these elements, and then allows us to utilize it uh, as we move through agriculture. Uh, feeding a lot of our animals and so there is an inherent need to understand some of these processes as we move through uh, you know so aerobic metabolism the the lower equation on there is the one that our body works off of and it's exact almost uh, reverse of the one above it so you know when we are out there talking to you know a lot of the audiences and stuff we talk about nutrient cycling these things are very important and just understanding these basic fundamentals you know, the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, as we move these things around uh, and uh, the energy that we can trap inside there, the energy, energy we can release in there and how it drives some of the efficiencies. We talk a lot about genetics and it's really about, you know, getting these efficiencies out of these compounds. You know, it's also about, you know, talking to our consumers about upcycling. That, you know, this is part of the pathway and the mechanism in which we harvest this energy from the sun and then we have animals consume these products, uh, these plants that it produces and make those products uh, that much more nutritious or viable to drive uh, our own body's needs and, and the lives that we have. And so, you know, I, I encourage the industry to continue to educate and talk about upcycling. But one of the topics that, you know, I get asked about quite a bit, uh, you know, is this whole thing about plants versus animals and uh, alternative proteins. And you're going to have another speaker on the panel that's uh, probably going to be able to speak a lot more elegantly about you know, alternative proteins than I can. And again, maybe I take a little different approach to it. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, you know, that we try to pay, you know, point one of those guys against the other. Again, I go back to the slide where I showed you the absolute protein needs that we're going to need on this planet. Uh, there's room for proteins coming out of plants and out of animals. And so I don't really get trapped down into the debate, should we have alternative protein products out there? You know, I, I do believe that we've seen the vegan and vegetarian levels be pretty uh, level and, and pretty low in terms of the percentage of our consumer base over time. Uh, the one that we've seen uh, growing is the flexitarian one, and, and we understand that those people are going to want some choices. Uh, they're going to want animal proteins. They're also going to maybe want to try some of these types of things. What I focus in uh, when I hear people talking about the alternative protein structure uh, or marketplaces is I, I want to hear why consumers are interested in those products. And once I learn what's in those products or what's desirable about those products, then I want to go ahead and, and enhance those same things in our animal-based products so that we, you know, make them even that much more competitive than what they are now. And so, you know, I guess I really don't get caught down in this debate, and I encourage you to maybe take the same approach. Let's understand what's driving people that direction. Let's go ahead and capitalize on that. Let's use that as a learning tool, and let's, you know, if there's an opportunity to enhance some of those things, then let's go ahead and, and, and design our products to, to be even more competitive in that space. Certainly, uh, you know, we, I, I like you and some of the things that they've come out and said, say, hey, we're not sure that's true. And the truth will come out. Uh, so let's not get trapped into the negative uh, space and around the arguments. Let's uh, throw that energy into a positive place and let's, let's uh, improve our products and make them more competitive. You know, this is some older data. It's back from the mid nineties. Uh, I would tell you that my 17 years uh, teaching students, uh, the, you know, 18 to 22 somethings, uh, watching my own kids, I don't think that, uh, that we're in a whole lot different place now than we were probably then. And if anything, uh, maybe these numbers are even higher. But as we look at the deficiencies and, you know, uh, percent of women over 20 not meeting recommended daily allowances. Uh, some of these are pretty striking. Uh, and the thing about this list is, you know, as we talk about the benefits of meat from a health standpoint, it's the B vitamins, it's the zinc, it's the iron, you know, calcium comes out there in, in some of our other uh, species where we, you know, uh, pull in the calcium. So 
we know that we have some uh, really great marketing attributes that are out there right now. Uh, you know, we meat has a very clean label. That's one of the things that some of the alternative proteins are are now starting to you know kind of face the, the task on. Meat is a healthy and nutritious product, uh, and and we know the all you know, and uh, we have beef councils that spend you know a lot of time educating, and I'm thankful that they do. You know, again, upcycling, the natural process of, of taking some of this stuff that would be indi indigestible to us because our bodies lack the ability to break down some of these bonds and these, you know, lignin and cellulose and hemicellulose. And, and these, you know, animals are, are, you know, we can think of them as bioreactors that are just making very, very nutritious products for us to put out to our consumers. And so, but I think there's ways that we can enhance some of that. You know, kind of the way I think about it is, you know, and here's my one plug uh, for a Wendy's uh, burger in here. So Dave's double, you know, I kind of joke a lot of times, say so, you know, any more nutrients than you need a prescription. So, you know, take this guy three to four times a week and, and, and move forward. So uh, some of the other things that I pay attention to, uh, you know, our source of our proteins is basically you know, North American, but certainly uh, we're in a global marketplace today. And so what's happening around the world in terms of imports and exports are going to influence and impact some of uh, the decisions that we make and certainly some of the price structures that we have. So been pretty excited about some of you know what we've seen happen over the last uh, year or two in terms of trade agreements. I believe trade agreements are, are a very important part of the business for the entire industry and just recognize that I think you know we've made some really good progress and you know I think uh, some of our associations have helped uh, get us uh, you know down that that page you know I, I hear a lot of the talk a lot of times around China uh, and how much opportunity there is in China. We, we talk a lot about how much uh, potential there is for growth and their middle class. And uh, of course there is, uh, it's, a, it's a huge market. There's going to be some more disposable income over time in China and it's a marketplace that we want to take a look at. Uh, the thing I would I guess caution you a little bit is, you know, you know, the United States is not the only shop in town. Uh, so as we look at this slide and we talk about, you know, how much uh, protein uh, going into China is coming out of the U.S., uh, there's some other uh, countries that are very competitive and, and rightfully so. And so we can't just uh, believe that China is going to be our answer to exports. I don't think anybody believes that. Um, they're certainly going to be a part of the puzzle, but let's understand the marketplace that's out there and what kind of impacts uh, it will have. South America has done, you know, I think a, a pretty nice job uh, working with uh, these markets and uh, maybe has done some really good things. I think we need to recognize that those folks are hungry to get those markets just as we are. Uh, and they're pretty capable and pretty competitive. So uh, keep those things in mind. You know, one of the things that keeps me up at night uh, is food security or food insecurity, depending how you want to talk about it. Uh, there will be a lot of mouths to feed. And I think, you know, food security uh, is one of those things uh, that if we're not careful, uh, could play, you know, major impacts here down the road. Uh, to me, food security is a, is a chess match. Uh, and it's been, been played out for a number of years now. Uh, and, and the U.S. is part of it. You know, we're in that chess match with a lot of other folks. But we can kind of see China really if you look at the map you see the need why they have to be worried about food security if we look at the, this slide shows a little bit about you know how they're trying to approach it uh, in this case the use of fertilizer uh, was tremendous to try to you know get some more production out there but you know they they do have a dilemma you know how can they produce enough safe food uh, for their population if uh, the Chinese start eating like Americans and you know the simple answer is they can't uh, you know, it takes about an acre to feed the average U.S. consumer, uh, and China just doesn't have enough um, quality arable land to produce that kind of food. And so they are, they realize that they're going to have to go out and figure out ways to do that. And they've been uh, pretty successful and pretty smart, uh, pretty deliberate in what they've done over the years and what they will do over the years. Uh, China's government, you know, uh, recognize this need for food uh, and they've taken some positions and done some actions in the marketplace to get there. I think, you know, if, if we look at this map and it talks about where China's made food investments, uh, land acquisition, 
or food investments and land acquisition, we need to recognize, you know, some of the things that are happening out there. I will, I will, you know, be the first to admit that, you know, all governments are doing this, you know, the United States government's doing this too. You know, we're going in and we're uh, working in some other countries to sure some of this stuff up. And I believe it's wise uh, from a food security uh, perspective and we need to do some of these types of things. But I think we also have to understand, uh, when another country comes into the United States and, and puts uh, some investments in place, whether it's food investments or land investments, what type of investment it is, we also, a lot of times in, in the United States, we don't think about the strength of the American dollar. Uh, you know, one of the things in my time when I spent uh, in Australia, it was interesting, you know, on the radio or on, on the news, it was about every 30 minutes or so, you know, there'd be an update talking about the strength of the Australian dollar, uh, which struck me a little bit funny at the time, but now as I get an appreciation for a global economy is a little bit more and makes so much more sense to me when these, uh, you know, investors are coming in from other uh, parts of the land and they're generating some revenue, the best way for them to spend that revenue is again in U S currency without having to try and take it through, you know, convert it back to one and then back to another. And so, when we start to see these investments uh, take place, you know, we, we need to understand that there could be some knock on effect and from an economic incentive, they want to keep doing some of that stuff, you know, from a food security perspective, you know, what I would call out uh, just big picture wise for us to think about uh, the WH group, you know, in 2013 purchased, uh, you know, Smithfield foods or the pork division. Uh, they are the largest uh, pork processor in the United States. Our second largest pork press, processor in the United States is, you know, um, based out of uh, a group in Brazil. And, you know, poultry, we see uh, some of that same stuff. And, and we can look at our own industry and we can talk about beef and we can talk about, you know, two of the largest uh, four beef processors that we have in this country uh, are foreign known. And so there is, I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. I'm saying it's something that we need to recognize. We need to understand what it means for us in terms of our markets and our production and opportunities in the future. Um, there has been some good come from those types of things, uh, but it's one that I keep my eye on. It's one that, you know, I, I kind of pay attention to. And as we look at, you know, the Chinese uh, consumer and we start to understand a little bit about who they are and what they are. And they say, you know, they pay more attention to where their food is coming from and they're often willing to pay more for safety. And I just think back to the talk that we heard a little bit ago from Sean Darcy. And he said, yep, our consumers are telling us they're paying a little bit more attention to where their food is coming from. You know, they're concerned about food safety. So, you know, all these things, uh, they're not, their customers aren't different than our customers. And so it makes sense uh, as to where they're going. One of these other things that, you know, as I look in the rear view mirror and I see something that's gaining ground on us and I'm glad to see the industry, uh, you know, taking some action on sustainability and some proactive things out there, but I think we need to keep the pressure up and keep moving forward. Uh, because the other businesses uh, also understand that, you know, they're kind of in that target area as well. Uh, and they put some pretty aggressive plans in place. And as they start to, uh, you know, engage in these plans and they start to make improvements over time, what that does is it changes the way this pie chart will look. And instead of agriculture, you know, being 9%, that percentage will start to grow. And, you know, we really need to watch that balance and, and we need to be doing some things to mitigate uh, to the extent that we can. And so that we're uh, continuing to, to produce our stuff in a very sustainable way as well. Uh, so, you know, their improvements, uh, and they will make improvements. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're staying lockstep balanced with those so that we don't start getting a bigger target on our back. Uh, this is a slide that many of you would have seen at Cattle Facts, uh, that, you know, Randy presented, uh, back in February. And I, I really liked the way he addressed this one. And so, you know, he and I, I think, or I think a little bit like he does on this, uh, topic. As we looked at the, the mid 80s through the you know, late 90s, you know, he said, um, and you look at the margins across the cow calf producer and uh, the stocker and the feedlot, the packer, there just weren't very many dollars to share. It just wasn't a very sustainable opportunity. But as we move into you know, the 2000s and up to current, we start to really see a little bit more of that pie for all of us to share. We can get into a place where you know, we can be more sustainable as an industry. And he said, you know, this is really demand 
growth at work. Uh, you know, the first half of that slide was the war on fat. You know, we were just kind of getting beat up in the marketplace. So we really need to keep that consumer demand strong. Uh, and, you know, we need the consumer demand to be strong if we're selling you know, burgers in our business and that kind of stuff. But really, so, you know, what's going to help drive that consumer demand? And I think that's where we start coming back and we start talking about some of these, you know, ESG or environmental, social, and, and, and governmental challenges or issues that are out there. And so, you know, sustainability, uh, health, and nutrition. I, I happen to believe that, you know, beef is a very, very healthy product. I happen to be one who believes that we can make it even healthier uh, based on the genetics that we use, the production practices and nutrition. I think there's some opportunities for us, you know, maybe not uh, across the board, although I believe there are, but certainly in some of these niche market areas or, or white tablecloth or specific type markets, um, you know, greenhouse gas and, and environment, uh, those things aren't going to go away. They're in their rear view mirror. And they're bearing down on us. Uh, animal welfare is, is front and present and, you know, not going anywhere. And antibiotics, uh, you know, that's one of the ones that we probably get questioned the most on. Uh, and I can tell you that there were a couple of surprise, you know, people say, what was the biggest change for you when you moved from, you know, academia to industry? You know, one of them was, uh, you know, when I was the department chair versus uh, working in the co-op that produces the, or purchases the protein for, for Wendy's uh, North America is where they put that decimal point in the budget. Uh, it's, it's a few spaces over now. Uh, but the other one was really, and I thought that I had a pretty good appreciation for how much pressure is placed on uh, companies like Wendy's from uh, some of these groups that are out there and I'll, you know, I will, until I really got involved with the animal welfare council and, and was um, more involved with these things, I, I underestimated and I can guarantee you that you are underestimating the pressure and the tactics that are placed on, on these companies that are on the front lines with the consumers on topics like animal welfare and antibiotics. And the other thing that I'll, I'll say is, you know, a lot of times when we look at the data as an industry, as a beef industry, we say, well, our consumer looks at antibiotics and they're, this percent is concerned with it. And they look at hormones and this percent is con concerned with it. And they look at beta agonists and this percent is con concerned with it. What we need to realize is that our consumers aren't nearly as educated on those products as we are because we use them. And so, they don't differentiate between them because they don't understand enough to know that one is different than another. They're all the same to them. So I'm not sure that we should be looking at those saying, well, 5% are here, 5% are here, and 10% are here. It's more like 20%. Those things are all viewed the same. And, and maybe we need to start asking some of our questions a little bit differently to really get uh, a handle on what, uh, what our consumer is actually after and what their desires are. So, you know, again, I, I come back to this uh, topic about, you know, what's in your mirror. I can tell you that, um, you know, it didn't matter whether I was out giving an extension talk while I was at the university or when I sit down now to have talks with people in our supply chain. When I sit down across the table, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, what species it is, doesn't matter if it's beef, doesn't matter if it's pork, doesn't matter if it's chicken, it doesn't matter what part of the supply chain they're in, whether it's a producer, whether it's a backgrounder, whether it's a feedlot operator, whether it's a packer, whether it's a distribution partner. There's two enemies in that room when I sit down to the table to have discussions with them. And those two enemies are greed and tradition. And they're always going to be there. And I recognize that they're always going to be there. And it's helpful for me to recognize that those are the enemies, not the person sitting across the table. And so I try to focus that discussion on, you know, how do we, the person sitting across the table from me, work uh, to get her, you know, away from those two people and talk about how we can do some things and maybe change the way we do business so that we're not beating each other up, but we're trying to help each other along that path. You know, that I we often talk about, you know, what's that definition of insanity? And it comes back to doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. And we need to recognize that there are opportunities to change the way that we work together and the way that we do some things. We need to recognize there are some ways that we can change our production uh, systems. Uh, and 
let's not just go out there and practice insanity and try and do the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome. You know, transparency is the currency of trust in today's consumer. And, you know, there have been some events, events in times or over recent times that you know, maybe have eroded some of that trust. And for us to win that battle and get that confidence back, we're going to have to be transparent. We're going to have to get out there and we're going to have to build that trust. And so, you know, I think there's some opportunities. I think the industry is, is really uh, taking some proactive changes. And I see a lot of discussions. I'm encouraged by what I see happening out there. I would just encourage us to continue to take that mindset and, and move in that direction. I believe all of you have the opportunity to help shape the story, you know, that would be told about uh, animal proteins in the future, uh, particularly, you know, beef. But I know a lot of you, uh, you know, are diversifying in your production programs too. You know, you're, you're also raising some crops here, you know, maybe um, doing multi-species, uh, not different than, you know, the rest of our structures. But I believe that you have a part and a role to play. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about plant-based proteins, you know, biosecurity, animal welfare, traceability and transparency, uh, food security or sustainability. Uh, you know, we all have some opportunities to, to get out there and be a part of, uh, of improving this industry and, and moving it forward. You know, I, as I look through, uh, you know, what we have laying ahead of us, you know, we always go back and we can say change is better is inevitable progress is not uh, you know we have a moral obligation from my perspective to per pursue the production of a safe and abundant food supply and to mitigate negative impacts on our community's environment uh, you know I, I believe that uh, our consumers needs and desires will change our markets will continue to change and therefore we must change you know, and the changes will be you know even how we think about it how we execute it and how we educate people about it. So, you know, if we come back to, you know, the original question that I was tasked with, you know, what we need, what we want, I would tell you that, you know, what we need are partners who aren't afraid to explore change and who aren't afraid to talk about a different way uh, to produce our beef products and hopefully to enhance them and make them more competitive so that we can continue to build the industry. Thanks very much. Thank you, Henry. That was uh, outstanding. Um, we've got uh, a, a bit of time here for some uh, some questions, and um, we'll remind uh, our viewing audience to uh, um, put those um, in the in the Q and A. Um, uh, mechanism, if you wouldn't mind, that'll that'll help us. Um, got one in from Wes. Thanks for uh, being uh, uh, snappy there, Wes. Appreciate that very much. Um, Wes asks, what changes in beef production um, would make the most positive difference to current consumer concerns? Good question. Yeah, no, that is a good question. It's a, a challenging question. So, you know, I, I think probably. You know, our, as, as Sean alluded to, different consumers uh, have different concerns. I think we've done uh, a really nice job of an industry, you know, uh, looking at uh, improvements in animal welfare and husbandry and, uh, and a lot of those topics. Uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, some of our consumers uh, are concerned about, but they don't necessarily talk a lot about are, you know, keeping that product affordable. I know as we talk to, you know, our supply chain partners, uh, they're worried about, you know, affordability of production uh, and those types of things. And sometimes we talk about change, there are, there are costs associated with it. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, the industry and the Beef Improvement Federation has done a great job in promoting, uh, you know, genetic selection uh, for efficiency of production and, and how trying to, you know, uh, either mitigate some of those costs and so that we can reinvest those in some other areas. But I think uh, personally, I, I believe one of those changes uh, for one part of our consumers really uh, looking at our production strategies from a genetics and nutrition approach and saying, okay, how come, you know, we know that we have a, a very, very uh, healthful product 
but I think we can make it even more healthful. And I think there's some opportunities uh, to do that. And I think there's going to be some real market opportunities in the future. As I look at healthcare uh, in this country, and I look at the, some of those slides that I showed you up front, and I look at you know, the wave that is coming at us. Uh, but as we also, you know, look at uh, our life expectancy uh, getting longer, and we know that, you know, the health conditions and, and some of the health challenges come with that. And if we want to look at, you know, just the cost of health care, I don't know about you folks, but I can tell you that my health insurance goes up every year because it's not getting cheaper. Our younger generations, there's some things they are and there's some things they aren't. But, you know, one of the things they are is pretty savvy uh, about understanding uh, this kind of stuff. And I think we're actually going to, you know, we're starting to see a resurgence uh, from them interested in health and some of those attributes. So, you know, I would encourage you one of the areas that we maybe haven't focused on as much because it's been a crutch that we could lean on. Uh, that our product is so healthy uh, that maybe we could reinvest and take another look at that. And I think those are some of the ways that we can combat uh, some of the reactions, you know, knee jerk reactions I hear about people against uh, alternative proteins. And uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to be even more competitive and build these products so that are even more desirable. And, and so personally, I guess, you know, one of the reasons I'm answering the question that way, Wes, is, uh, personally, that's where some of my interests are, uh, because I believe there's a real opportunity uh, as we move forward five and 10 years down the road. I know that those changes don't happen overnight, and we have to have the mindset that it may take us 10 years to, to get there. Uh, but, you know, if we don't start to, to walk, we're not going to run. And I believe there's some opportunity to do some of that foundation work now, uh, particularly with some of the genetic tools that, you know, our researchers have made available to us. Great, thanks, Henry. Um, the uh, next uh, question here uh, from Tyler is, what role do third-party audits play uh, in sustainability and consumer confidence? Now, that's a good question, Tyler. And, you know, we, we get into some of these uh, conversations from time to time. And it really comes back to uh, the comments about uh, transparency. And so third-party audits for us, uh, are important in terms of a verification step. Uh, and so there's a lot of times where we're in a position where, you know, if we're talking to somebody, uh, and, you know, it's not always the consumer. Uh, you know, what you, what you need to understand about some of these businesses is they have multiple audiences. And I think you know, a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody, they, you know, they think our only audience is the consumer. And our consumer is certainly a big audience uh, and one that, that we want to interact with and we want to interact with positively. But when you're dealing with a publicly traded company, uh, you know, one of your audience is also your shareholders. Uh, one of your audiences is, is going to be your board members. Uh, they're also going to be your uh, restaurant operators. And so there's a lot of audiences out there that we're communicating with. And, and they're asking us to, to do X, Y, or Z. You know, one of those audiences might be some of these uh, groups that maybe don't want us to be in business. You know, we talk about a lot of times I, I, I use the general term interest groups uh, and the interest groups for me range all the way from advocacy groups. And there's a lot of them that are to activist groups, uh, but they're also talking to us. And so a third party audit is a way where we can have verification uh, from, you know, an unbiased source uh, that, you know, can verify that we're doing or we're trying to do the things that we're saying that we're doing. So that we go out there and we talk to our customers, we have some, some transparency and we have some truth to come in behind that. So from a sustainability standpoint, um, it's an opportunity. Uh, sometimes if we say, well, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, and they say, well, you're telling me that, but I don't know if it's really happening. It's an opportunity for us to to really have a, a non-biased point of view to verify that yeah this is happening and yeah they're you know they're putting their money where their mouth is and uh, the integrity here that you you know that that they're talking to you about is real and true and so I think you know uh, there's no debating that audits have added a certain amount of cost in terms of time and money uh, but I believe they're important. Great, thanks, Henry. Um, next question here. Um, this is with regard to alternative pro 
proteins. Uh, what are you hearing are the primary benefits consumers say they are looking for um, as they seek out alternatives? And how might we apply that to enhance beef as you suggested? Good, insightful question. Yep. Uh, so alternative protein stuff. I mean, uh, you know, I'm probably hearing a lot of the same things that uh, the dis audience is hearing. You know, sometimes we hear uh, that they want to talk about, you know, different, different, uh, you know, health aspects. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they spend uh, good money on uh, their marketing teams as well. And so, uh, of course, uh, you know, good marketing team is going to try and get you to focus on, you know, one aspect or, you know, the things uh, they're certainly not going to talk about some of the other aspects. And so I think over time, uh, some of the health aspects that, uh, that came out pretty early on, uh, there's been some good information that's pushed back on some of that. And, you know, uh, there's some give and take on those things. The other thing that, you know, we continue to hear just like you do, are you know uh environmental uh aspects in terms of uh you know environmentally friendly production those types of things uh, again uh they have uh, pretty talented marketing teams there's been a little bit of spin on some of those things and we've been able to you know across the different industries uh push back and then and, and you know maybe educate and shed some more light in some areas there uh one of the things that uh you know is, is convenience uh our consumers you know uh you know, we talked about it in one of the early slides, you know, time is a form of currency. And so convenience uh, never gets old, never goes away. And some of these products from a convenience standpoint uh, may be a little bit uh, more convenient. Of course, uh, we've done uh, great strides in our industries in trying to make our products uh, more convenient, a little bit uh, user friendly. Uh, so there's some opportunities there. Those really aren't, uh, you know, at the production level we're talking about convenience. Those are more uh, in the manufacturing level and the things we do to it. I think, you know, uh, one of the advantages that we do have uh, is just how clean our label is uh, and the number of ingredients that are on our labels. Uh, I mean, they're pretty pure. Uh, they're pretty clean. Uh, and so, you know, that's one that we can leverage. But I really do believe uh, from uh, we can build, you know, uh, from from a health aspect and as we learn the science has gotten so much better in the last few years and there was a time uh, when fats were viewed as bad and now that we're learning uh, you know not all fats are created equal in fact there's probably a lot more to this fat thing than, than we ever realized and as we you know my background is in meat science as we start digging into the the microstructure in these fats and we talk about triglycerides versus phospholipids and we talk about the fatty acid profiles uh, in phospholipids versus triglycerides and what the biological function of those things are in a live animal but then what the you know the food value or the nutritional value is in these different fat depots and the different fatty acid ratios uh, in our bodies when we consume those products and i just think there's a lot of unlocks there I think because we're dealing with ruminant animals, we have some opportunities to, to really explore those and expand on those. And, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm excited about some of those opportunities in my own uh, small program here at home. Uh, I focus uh, quite a bit uh, from a genetic standpoint, uh, just on what kind of fat and fatty acid profiles uh, from a genetic standpoint, I'm setting these cattle up to have. And then nutritionally, how to uh, try to capitalize on the genetics that are in them, because that's the kind of food that I want my kids to be eating. Yeah, great perspective there, Dr. Zerby. Um, a question from uh, uh, one of our uh, viewers from uh, from Brazil. Uh, Helen asks, um, uh, how to communicate um, our beef business in a more positive way to the final consumer? So maybe kind of an international perspective um, that you might lend there and, and how um, you know, it's, you've, you've traveled the, the world and, and know a little bit about uh, uh, Brazil's system. What, uh, what advice might you give Helen? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a neat question. And anytime you're trying to, you know, interface with that, that final consumer and, you know, I guess, you know, the first thing I generally try to do is, is find some common ground with them and understand what their interests are. Uh, you know, and if, if it's, it's from a health aspect or if it's a environmental aspect or if it's from a animal welfare aspect. And I think, you know, I have had an opportunity to, you know, witness uh, animal production, livestock production and, and, 
in uh, different continents and several different countries. And, you know, one of the things that I've always been impressed about, it doesn't matter what part of the globe you walk or travel, uh, the passion that our producers have uh, for these, for the animals and, and just the respect they have for the environment they operate in. And, you know, and their desire to produce a, a high quality product. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I always think about when I'm on my own farm back here and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's going to be the most efficient manner. You know, I try to take a look at what resources I have, what animals can capitalize on that and how I work with mother nature rather than fight mother nature. Cause I don't think we're going to win that battle. Uh, she's got, you know, a lot more time on her side than we do. And she's got uh, a lot more resources than I do. Uh, so, you know, from, from the perspective of, you know, a, a grass fed program, just, you know, and those kinds of situations, I kind of start talking about, you know, the upcycling, the value of, of how much, you know, energy that we're capturing through photosynthesis in these plants and then how we're transforming that energy and those nutrients into something that can be bioavailable or digested in our bodies because we're transforming them into a product that we can digest and consume rather than plants where we, you know, we only get a limited amount of those nutrients out of there. And so, you know, I start coming back to the messaging on upcycling. And as we talk about sustainability and, and the importance of sustainability as we continue to move forward in this industry and supplying the needs of our consumers across the globe, this upcycling is one that we have to just really start talking more about. And uh, I think ourselves, we need to get uh, kind of educated and grounded in it so that we can have those discussions. And and when we have them, we have to, you know, we have to present them in a manner that our consumer will understand. You know, it can't be this nerdy approach that I often take where I'm, you know, I'm showing you guys equations. But, you know, we have to figure out how we talk to it and, 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 and tell, deliver that message through stories uh, that they can understand. I believe they will appreciate it. I believe, uh, you know, our consumers are savvy. Uh, they're smart. Uh, we just need to sit down and have those conversations. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, find that common ground. And once you find that common ground, then you can kind of steer those conversations to your strengths. Yep. That's right. Um, great, great, uh, perspective there. Um, last, uh, last question here, and then we'll, uh, we'll dally off for the day with, uh, just a couple of wrap up slides, um, Henry. And, and so, um, um, this one's from Jorge and it says, uh, is it accurate to portray producers as old and consumers as young? Uh, I don't know that it's accurate to portray. And I don't agree with that. I mean, if you, uh, even the slide that I showed up front uh, shows that, you know, a lot of our consumers, at least in the United States, um, with the baby boomer generation, uh, I believe that a lot of our consumer base is going to be, uh, I don't necessarily uh, say old, but uh, more advanced in years. And so, and uh, there is, I guess, you know, a stigma out there, uh, you know, that our, our producers are, are old. Uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by the youth that I see in a lot of these meetings today, uh, the technology and, and how adaptive they've been. And, and uh, not to say that uh, some of our uh, senior producers aren't really getting into the technology and using some of those advantages. Uh, producers being, uh, consumers being young, I think uh, part of the reason that sometimes we get our heads wrapped around that is, is we do realize and understand just from the marketing uh, data that's out there just how much power Generation Z uh, has in, in influencing, uh, you know, consumer trends that are moving forward. And so this, you know, this consumer target uh, is changing and these younger ones uh, do have a lot of flow, uh, power and that balance has changed over the last 10 or 15 years. And part of that, again, is the extrinsic factors. So uh, again, I go back to understanding that powers of balance will change and not necessarily by anything that happened inside our industry, but what happened around us, you know, this whole explosion of social media over the last 10, 15 years and people who have adopted to those technologies faster than others is influencing that marketplace and that market space. And, you know, we do tend to believe that uh, those younger generations that never knew a time when they didn't have a cell phone, uh, never knew a time when they didn't have internet. Uh, they're so savvy and so quick to jump on those things and communicate that way. That's part of what gives them that power. So we have to recognize 
that, you know, the industry infrastructure and the industry market structure that we operate under today is very different than what it was 20 years ago. And I think that's sometimes why some of those uh, maybe blanket statements come into play, but yeah, not necessarily true, but it's really understanding those extrinsic factors and the influences that are having on our industry and, and actually, you know, understanding how to capitalize on those things as we move forward. I think there's some tremendous opportunities in developing some uh, targeted beef products uh, for, uh, you know, these these baby boomers and a lot of them have done very well uh and you know they're going to be moving into some assisted living or some retirement situations and one of the things that's going to motivate them as we know is you know time and health but they also care about what they eat and they have some disposable income and they're willing to you know pay for products and uh, high quality healthy products uh so that they can enjoy their remaining year so some real yeah, I think it's the one of the real interesting things is that you know you've sort of got the 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 folks with the disposable income you know people that are typically a little bit older um, in general I would say and I think some of the the checkoffs data supports um, you know invest uh, they they dine out they consume beef they buy more expensive cuts um, so on but if we don't cultivate and foster young people buying our product, um, then the opportunity to market them becomes much different later in life. And so you kind of have this uh, sort of bifurcation in, in, in marketing strategy of sort of upper end restaurant uh, premium cuts towards people with disposable income versus you know real value kind of products towards uh, younger folks um, to get them uh, to consume beef and, and 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 buy our products. It seems like. And do you do you agree with that? Does that kind of line up with what you see? Absolutely. Yep. Spot on. Yep. Yep, great. Well, Dr. Zerby, thanks again for uh, for joining us. Uh, I know our uh, group uh, uh, really benefits, um, um, you know, as, as you know, kind of the um, who's who in beef cattle genetics and selection programs attends BIF and uh, helping us get our head around what uh, challenges lay ahead of us um, helps plot out uh, our trajectory. You know, the old, old saying of um, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Um, we want to be on, a, on the right path in the right direction and uh, uh, talks like yours and Sean's um, is really, really helpful to our team and, and our uh, partners and producers um, to get uh, pointed the right direction. So thanks for joining us. State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. The convention will be located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. Iowa State University is just north with its research and teaching farms. Join us in Iowa and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application. <laughs>